Hi, my name is Seth Roberts. I'm a professor um, at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Professor of psychology. Uh, most people track for, you know, when, when people collect numbers day after day, they usually do it for one of these three reasons. They, there's something they want to do more of, there's something they want to do less of, or uh, in my case, I, I want to improve my sleep. So I measure my sleep for a long time, day after day. But now I'm tracking something that doesn't fit into any of those categories, and I'm going to explain why. I'm measuring how fast I do arithmetic. So I do a bunch of problems and just measure how fast I do it. So I'm doing this for two reasons. I, um, a few years ago, I um, happened to take uh, several flaxseed oil capsules. And the next morning, I noticed my balance was better. And I, I did a bunch of, uh, I measured my mental function in other ways, and I found that flax oil also improved a bunch of different ways of measuring how, brain, how well my brain worked. So that made me think that big improvements might be possible. And because I was in Beijing, I was worried that the pollution would make my brain worse. Okay. Um, and the second reason was observations about scientific progress. If you look at most papers, most, you know, 99.9% .9 of scientific papers, it doesn't seem like they got very far. And if you read scientific history, you, all, you see that a lot seems to turn on this or that accident. You know, there's some accident that makes a big difference. So if you put those two facts together, which are really, really obvious, it, it suggests that the, the distribution of scientific progress um, has a power law distribution, that each time you do an experiment, you're sampling. Oh. Um, You're sampling from a power law distribution. It looks like this. Um, so, you know, most of the time, your, your data just confirms your ideas, and then if you're lucky, you're, it actually shows you're wrong about something. That's really rare. And it's incredibly rare that you collect some data that, that um, gives you a new idea. Um, but see, the idea here, here, my idea is a little bit like it seems pallid. That, you know, we, his idea is that we really don't appreciate the possibility of something awful happening. And here I'm saying we really don't appreciate. Uh, um, we really don't appreciate the probability of something really good happening. We, we underestimate it, and so it's like buying a lottery ticket where your odds are better than you think. And and, and that's what I'm trying to do here. I, you know, you want you know you might think, oh, why well, measure your arithmetic? I mean, that's a waste of time. Well, I'm saying it's like a lottery ticket. It's worth a lot more than you think. So I want to, I'm going to do this thing along, you know, often, day after day. So I wanted it to have several features. I wanted to, um, I didn't want to just get one number. I want to get several numbers so I could have some idea of the variability. Um, several numbers from each testing session, in other words. I wanted it, um, I want to be able to take it around. I didn't want to be, you know, if I go on, if I move, I want to be able to take it with me. And on vacation, perhaps. Um, I don't want to take very long because I'm going to be doing it again and again. And so, um, three minutes seem to be about the maximum. And of course, it should be safe. I, it turned out that some tasks, if, if you're doing too much, I, got, I started to get my, um, something you know, on the way to repetitive strain injury. So I didn't want that. And personally, I wanted to be programmable in R because that's the language I knew best. And that's where I was going to analyze the data. So in order to analyze the data well, I it, you know, had to use R. And those are requirements, and I also had a desire, which is it should be fun. I mean, this is in some sense the most important one. Um, but I, I, I haven't gotten very far yet. I have a long way to go in making it fun. <laughs> anyway, the, the, I've, I've, I've studied about six tasks, and this is, sort of, this is the, the best I've gotten so far. There's a simple arithmetic task and um, questions like eight plus six. And I just type the last digit of the answer as fast as possible. And there's a possible answer. So I, I just leave my key, I, leave, I don't have to move my, my fingers. And I do 32 trials a session. That's sort of the maximum I can bear. And it takes about three minutes. It's written in R. The, I, I try to be a little more enjoyable by having feedback after every trial, which makes it sort of competitive and interesting. That really helps a lot. I'm going to show you what it's like. So I. 
it's self-paced. I don't worry, I can do it as fast or slow as I want. I see the screen, I see a question like this, and I type the answer, which would be two. And then I get, a, I get some feedback. So the 17th percentile means it's pretty slow. Like a really good, really good answer would be 95 percentile. I would be, I'm always very pleased when I get that. <laughs> so that sort of thing keeps it, makes it a lot more fun than it would be otherwise. Way more fun. Okay, I talked about this before at Stanford, here at the Quantified Cell. And I did so because an anomaly had come up in my data. And um, so these are, you know, these are the scores over you know, about nine months. And you can see that um, it's just sort of slowly coming down. But um, for a couple of months, they've been pretty steady at around 630, and then all of a sudden it drops below 600. So I thought, oh wow, why is that? Can I, you know, do I, do I have any idea why? Why is my brain all of a sudden you know, doing, doing so much faster? And I knew enough about experimental psychology that this kind of drop is, is really remarkable, very rare. I mean, certainly nobody ever, no one's ever taken this kind of data, but just to, in an experiment to get people to speed up by that amount, all of a sudden is very, very unusual. Anyway, so the question is, what caused that? The first question is, can I repeat it? And the next day I did. I tried to do the stuff I'd done before, and you can see I got the low score again. So whatever it was, it was under my control, apparently. It wasn't just some random thing. Um, and then the question was, why? why? Why did that happen? And I had a whole bunch of different ideas. Maybe I had six ideas. And, and finally, I whittled them down to um, one idea that was butter. Um, later, there was another anomaly where the score dropped about 50 more milliseconds. And I don't understand that one. Anyway, after that point, I started to eat more butter. And, and by more butter, I mean half a stick of butter per day. <laughs> Which you think is a lot, but I think might not be enough. I, mean, I think it might not be optimal. And we can talk about that in the question period, why I think that. Okay, here's the, here's the additional data. <laughs> Ever since I started eating a butter, stick of butter per day, my scores have been down where, down where they were. So this is not proof, but it's certainly evidence in favor of the idea that, lo and behold, butter makes me uh, 30 milliseconds faster on this task. Which is, as I, to an experimental psychologist, that's a lot. So another interesting thing is that I substituted, this is not animal fat, I actually substitute the butter for pork fat. So I was I was having a lot of but I was having a lot of pork fat before because it improved my sleep, and I switched over from the, the manipulation of more butter views, butter instead of pork fat. It's not just more fat. It's much more interesting than that. Anyway, here are my conclusions. Okay, butter improves brain function. I'm sure that my results from arithmetic, are not just it's not just arithmetic. I'm sure. Um, Here's the value of, of tracking health uh, in the absence of obvious problems. I did not have a problem with arithmetic. Um, and the, the, more, the really interesting point here is that maybe measures of brain function are more sensitive to the environment than other health measures. It's like a canary in the coal mine because the brain changes really fast and the, you know, other organs don't. You know what the answer is, and it's how fast you can respond to that. So it, it, it's, it's not anything to do with arithmetic. Well, I think a lot of people do arithmetic by having remembered the answers. No, it's not arithmetic. It's not adding. You're not adding anything. You're just responding. You that, you know, 11 minus 2, 9, you know that that is such a response. So oh, yeah, it's a table lookup. Yes, that's right. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are about 200 questions. Right. Any questions? I have severe allergies, so it would be you actually use your measuring arithmetic and then were able to identify a food or something that helped you increase your ability to cognitively process something, essentially, like with the traction, is that? Yes, that's right. Okay, so that would be something I would use for myself because I've noticed that like when I'm having allergies, my cognitive productivity drops by 40% or more. It oh, that's interesting. a lot longer 
to actually process mentally things that when I'm not having allergies are a lot quicker. And a lot of it I found like certain foods. <coughs> You can't me numerically measure your allergy? Well, I haven't been, because I didn't, this would be a good way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, very cool. Yeah. In that vein, how did you detect that butter was making a difference? Oh, I tried other things, and butters, <laughs> they didn't seem, the other things didn't seem to make any difference. <laughs> and and um, there was another thing which I haven't said, which is that one day, normally I would eat a lot of pork fat. But that was very easy to get in Beijing, but quite hard to get in Berkeley. A lot of pork fat. And, and one day I couldn't get any pork fat. And I was having lunch with a friend. I said, okay, I'll just have butter instead of pork fat. And then a couple hours later, I felt really good. And that suggested that butter was having an effect on my brain, that pork fat wasn't. And so that got me interested. Yeah, so it's turning into cardiology night here. <laughs> I, I don't know where to begin, but... <laughs> <laughs> Corn fat's a really bad idea. Did you try fish oil capsules? Yeah, I, saw, I found that effect a long time ago, that omega-3 helped. And so this is in addition to omega-3. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not far-fetched. Uh, in the early cholesterol-lowering trials, there was an unexpected increase in suicide rates, and it was postulated that the brain is very rich in <coughs> membranes <coughs> and neuronal cells, and that something about the stir disturbing cholesterol metabolism affects the membrane potentials of the neurons and has subtle behavioral effects. So I don't discount that there's a biological linkage here. But um, if you keep up with the butter, you're going to uh, promote atherosclerosis in the brain arteries. Well, uh, you know, it's funny. I think that data is extremely clear. And I, well, I, think, I think the data connecting butter and more heart attacks is not nearly as clear. <laughs> yeah, 50 years of epidemiology. There's a big difference between a survey, you know, a survey and Well, a I would also point out on the basis of that data, the rate of heart attacks has dropped by more than 50% since 1968 and continue to go down. So oh, I, I think it's hard to know why heart attacks are going down. I really do. No, you don't. It's, I, it's, 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 it's darn easy to know why heart attacks have gone down. It's deliberate intervention on the part of the medical establishment. It's not... I, I think a lot of things have changed over the past 10 years. Well, anyway, uh, do what you want. <laughs> I will say that a stroke will slow you way down. Well, my blood pressure is also going down. The butter has lowered my blood pressure. <laughs> Since you wrote that in R, did it, did it tell you what the, the sort of 95% confidence intervals were on the odds ratio for that difference? What difference? The difference um, in mental performance that you got between butter and pork fat. Um, oh, the p-value is extremely high for the uh, last slide. Um, there are there are actually um, error bars on all these all these points, or maybe I took them off. But yeah, I do get error bars. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and those drops were highly reliable. We're going to take two more questions. We have another great talk today. Yeah. Uh, did you have any baseline from before pork fat? Because I'm wondering how much this is switching the butter versus like cleaning out the uh, pork fat. <laughs> um, I did experiments with pork fat where I'd have them one day and not another day, and, and they never showed up anything on these tests, but they did show they it did improve my sleep. So that's why I was eating a lot of pork fat because my sleep was better that night. So I have pork fat for lunch, my sleep is better. And, and you might start getting occasional parotid ultrasound. I, I, I did have one last year, long before I started this. So I do have a baseline, yeah. Okay. Okay, who feels like they have a great last oh, question? Come on, I have a great one. Oh. Am I better? No, he pointed at me. Let's take two last ones. All right, go ahead. One thing that can explain is that the power of belief is really strong. And so this could be a, pl a placebo effect. Wow. Where, oh, yeah? So what the amendment really calls for is a, a study of so that you don't know what you're taking, whether it's pork fat or butter. Yeah. And so when you remove butter, right, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I, I don't think the placebo explanation does a very good job of explaining why I was so surprised. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next. Okay, mine's, mine's really short. I'm really glad you came back with some more detailed stuff because I've been thinking about this ever since we saw you at Stanford. And my question is this. If we can get 50 or 100 volunteers 
to try this, would you help us run the same protocol with more people? Uh, yes, I will, but I would suggest you start with two volunteers. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to go on. We have another great talk, but thank you so much.